from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Don Wilson. Tonight's play, Edward, My Son, is a forceful drama that relates the tragic results in the family when the father is determined his only child shall have everything his money can buy. Metro Golden Mayor brought this gripping drama to the screen, and we shall present one of their outstanding stars in the leading role, Walter Pidgeon. And now, Walter Pidgeon, starring in the dramatic story of Edward, My Son. Shelton Motor Company, a great national newspaper, and two or three biscuit companies. I don't tell you this to boast, merely to establish some sort of contact with you, because I want your opinion. I want you to answer a question. Trouble is, of course, that none of you knew Edward. Edward was my son, my only son. He was 23 when he was killed, a lovely boy with a charming smile. I can remember when Edward was a baby. We were plain Mr. and Mrs. Bolt then, living in a little place in Hammersmith. Arnold! Oh, how wonderful, darling. It's just beautiful. The best baby carriage they have in the store. But of course. Oh, he'll love it, dear. And that isn't all. I've been buying looks. Champagne. Uh -huh. Oh, Arnold, what a birthday. <laughs> Look. Look what I've made for him. Oh, it's magnificent. I've never seen such a birthday cake. I wrote that myself on the ice. Really? Happy birthday, Edward. Well, that seems to cover it. But, but don't you think a happy birthday to Edward would have been better? Oh, no, no, no. This is perfect. And, and this is happy birthday to Mother from Edward. Oh, oh, mm. a necklace. <laughs> and real imitation pearls. Oh, how did you ever manage it? Someday you are going to have real, real pearls. Big ones. I? You believe in me, don't you? Why, yes, of course. Why do you ask? Because I've just gone into a new business. Arnold. And I thought I'd like to do it on Edward's birthday. Might be lucky. Well, I've got to wash up. Oh, but, Arnold, what business? Uh, Americans call it installment buying. Instead of saving up to buy something, you buy it right away and, and, and pay for it gradually. Not so loud, dear. You'll wake Edward. Pay for what? Well, uh, uh, furniture chiefly, stoves too, I think. Maybe ice boxes. Well, it must be a very nice kind of business. You'll make people happy. Oh, well, that isn't quite why I'm going into it. Uh, now, suppose we open the champagne. Oh, right? but Dr. Woodhope will be here any minute. I think... Oh, oh dear, he's here now. Uh, it might be Harry. Harry? Harry Simpkins. Oh, darling, don't be silly. He's my partner in your business. Well, but he's been to prison. Well, he's out now. Harry was unlucky, that's all. Well... I don't understand, Arnold. He's got some capital and a good business brain. It's, it's the chance of a lifetime for me. Oh, he might trick you into something. Oh, don't you worry about that. Oh, I just don't want anything to be different, that's all. I'm so happy with things as they are, and I... Well, Arnold, he's still waiting. Well, let him in. Well, but what can I say to him? Uh, ask him how he likes being in prison, oh. dear. Coming. Just a minute, please. Oh! It wasn't I expected? Oh, oh, yes, of course, Dr. Woodhope. Well, I just thought it was... Oh, dear. Please come in, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, oh, um, uh, this is for Edward. It's, um, it's a teddy bear. Oh, you are kind. He'll just adore it. Darling, don't look what Dr. Woodhope brought. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. You know, it, it's got Edward's ears, too, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and look what I've got for you, Doctor. Champagne. Well, dear, dear. He can uh, mix it with his milk, can't he? <laughs> oh, that's a very interesting experiment, Mr. Bowles. Unfortunately, the young man's still sleeping. Well, don't be so sure, dear. Perhaps I'd better run in there and see. Excuse me, Doctor. Well, Mrs. Bowles tells me Edward's doing very nice. Oh, he's fine, fine. Uh, do you think his eyes should be examined? Uh, why? Is he finding it difficult to read? <laughs> so, no, no, but seriously, I just thought you might, well, you might want to check on it. Oh, you have a fine, healthy boy, Mr. Bolt. Don't you worry about him. 
It is a shame that he can't come down and see his presence, sir. Or hear the speech I'm about to make. Oh, dear. A long one? Well, well don't well, worry, well, Mrs. Burke. Well, there's a doctor present. <laughs> we drink to Edward. Edward, my boy, you're sound asleep, I hope. You've kicked your covers off, I'm sure. I just tucked them back. This is just to let you know that down here we have the matter of your future well in hand. Sleep safe, Edward. The world shall be your oyster. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean, Arnold? The world is his oyster. It means that nothing is going to be too good for him, ever. Yes, that was in 1919. Five years later, Evelyn and I were in the waiting room of a doctor's office. Some specialist would hope it sent us to. Edward was ill, seriously ill. And while we waited there in agony, Woodhope and the specialist were deciding the fate of our little boy. The boy is six, you say? Only child, Woodhope? Yes, Dr. Kedner. Mm -hmm. I attended Mrs. Bolt when he was born. I don't believe she can have another. Oh, it's too bad. The father, what were his circumstances? He has a furniture store. Mm -hmm. Hasn't been doing so well lately. Why? I was thinking of Schmidt in Switzerland. He does an operation for this condition, but quite expensive and no guarantee. No... No, you'd better not mention it. Well, then, uh, uh, Mobilize the leg in plaster of Paris for a year. After that, we'll see. Could I make it sound as hopeful as possible, Doctor? Of course, of course. Now, suppose you have them come in here. I, I, I don't mean to be rude, Dr. Kenner, but if you could just come to the point and tell me... Well, tell us. Mr. Bolt, your son is suffering from what we call an atrophy of the nerves in the hip. Permanent? No, no, not necessarily at all. In a year, I'm sure, we'll have him up and about again. He's to stay in bed? For the present, yes. We'll put him in a plaster cast. But but after the year, he he won't have a limp or... I have known of several most amazing recoveries, Mr. Bolt. Then, then he will limp. Oh, now, you mustn't fret, Mrs. Bolt. That would be bad for the boy. Isn't there something we could do? Isn't there a, 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 an operation or, or electric treatments or something? There's nothing that I can recommend, Mr. Bolt. We're very grateful, Dr. Kedner. I know that Edward's in the very best hands. Yes, but if he needs anything, I mean anything at all, we want him to have the best. Well, of course you do. But we must be patient. Yes. Goodbye, Doctor. Thank you. Not at all, not at all. Good day to you, Mr. and Mrs. Bolt. Well, I suppose Kevin knows what he's talking about. He is the best in London, Arnold. Can you come home with me? No, I, I can't, darling. Harry's waiting for me at the shop. You take a taxi. Oh, there's one now across the street. I, I, I'll get it for you. Larry, Edward won't get any worse, will he? You promise to tell me if he does? No, Evelyn, he won't get worse. But is there any reason for this? Anything I should have done? Anything I've done wrong? No, of course not. It could have happened to any child. But to Edward? My son, my only son, my... I can't just look at him and pretend I, I can't. Yes, you can. I can't. I can't. Evelyn, please. Oh, I'll be all right. Yes, of course you'll be all right. The taxi's coming, dear. Uh, why don't you go with her, Larry? Well, would you mind if I went on the bus with you, Arnold? I, I, I've got a few things. I, I... Oh, I'll be all right. Just try to come home soon, darling. Thank you, Larry. Uh, why didn't you go with her? Because I didn't want to mention this in front of her. Arnold, how much money could you raise? Why, I couldn't raise... Why do you ask? Is there something you could do? It isn't always successful, but there's a surgeon in Switzerland. Now, can you get hold of a thousand pounds? You mean Edward? You mean you limp? Well, all I can say is that if Edward were my boy, that's what I'd do. If I could, that is. And uh, if it were possible, it... Yes, I'm sorry, Arnold. I shouldn't have mentioned it. Now, look, don't, don't say anything to Evelyn till it's all been arranged. Just go back in there and tell that doctor my son is going to have whatever is best for him. Go on, go in and tell him that. Tell him he's going to have what's best for him. Then I uh, came straight here to the shop, Harry. I've got bad news for you. I've got to get out of the firm. Oh? Yes. I'll surrender whatever interest I have for what I put in five years ago. 
Well, that's very nice of you, old man. I wouldn't do it if it weren't for Edward. He needs that operation, and I need 1,500 pounds. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Arnold. But I've got bad news for you. Huh? While you were gone, Baker paid us a visit. Baker? From the bank? They gave us four weeks. I put all my money into this, everything I had. It wasn't enough. Oh, I'm so sorry. No. It wasn't your fault, Harry. But I've learned something now about bankruptcy. People who owe just a little go bankrupt. The little people. Next time I owe so much, they won't dare let me go under. How do you know there'll be a next time? There'll always be a next time for me. Look, couldn't we sell out to some other firm? No, yeah, we could. Except our stock has never been paid for. Hmm. And I've got a sort of prejudice about going to prison again. But supposing Edward were your son? Oh, listen, Arnold, I do anything within reason, anything. But the sad truth is, we're broke. How much fire insurance do we carry, Harry? Three thousand... Are you crazy? Oh, I want no part of it. Just an idea. What makes you think you could get away with it? Get away with what? Well, I'm glad you're not that crazy. Now, there's back premiums due... That's uh, why I thought you might like to, well, uh, put 200 more into the account. 200? For the back premiums. Then I could increase the insurance to 5,000, just in case something did happen around here. You said you only needed 1,500. Did I? You know, there's a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at its flood, leads on to fortune. Do you know who wrote that? No. Neither do I. But it wasn't a little man. And I'd be careful of that pipe, all this stuff around here. Why, it could go up just like that. Yes, you'd be careful of that pipe. <laughs> Sunday evening it was, I found Harry Simpkins waiting outside my house. Oh, I'd about given you up, Arnold. I'm glad I waited. I had to see you. Come on in, Harry. Ah. Oh, where's the missus and the little boy? Don't worry. They can't hear you. Now, listen, Arnold. I've been thinking things over. This fire insurance scheme of yours is off. See, it's, it's off. Is it? I was crazy to agree to it. Well, come to think of it, I never did agree to it. Didn't you? Then why did you give me the money for the back premium? Well, I want it back. And don't try to get smart with me, Arnold. Just give me back my money now. I didn't use your money for the premiums, Harry. Eh? Well, you mean the scheme's off? Well, why didn't you tell me? The scheme isn't off. I started the fire an hour ago. You? You what? I only needed a hundred for the premiums. The other hundred sent Evelyn and Edward to Switzerland, first class. Oh, I'll tell them the truth. That's what I'll do. No, no, no. Why not wait and see what happens? You'll sleep a lot better tonight if you do. But how will we, how will we know when it happens? Well, I suppose we'll hear the fire engines. They go practically right by here. Then I imagine the police will telephone me. Do you know how much we're insured for now, exactly? Well, you said 5,000. Six. I hope we haven't been too greedy. No, I think you've gone mad. Yeah, so do I. Well, then why did you do it? I did it because I was pushed. And if it works out, I'll never complain about my luck in the future, no matter what happens. I'll gamble it all tonight gladly. I believe if you want anything enough, if you can get it, and I want Edward to walk properly through life without a limp, that's all I ask, and nothing else matters, not in the slightest. Yeah, so it seems. Oh, come on, come on. I have a feeling that this is my lucky night. And if you're... That's a bit too soon. Well, go on, answer it. Answer it good and act surprise. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Bolt. Say you'll come along right away. Yes? Yes? What? Thank you. Thank you very much. You fool. Is that how you think a man acts when the police call up? That was a telegram, Harry. From Switzerland. Oh, Listen. It started. They operated this morning successfully. Successfully. Do you realize what that means? My boy's boy is going to be well. My boy won't limp. It means that Edward... Come over to the window, Harry. Yes, there's quite a glow in the sky tonight. Make a 
friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. There's hardly a home in Western Germany, for instance, which doesn't reflect the influence of Ellen McCloy, wife of our former High Commissioner to Germany. When Mrs. McCloy arrived in Germany in 1949, she decided to be more than just the wife of the High Commissioner. There were nearly 10 million outcasts in the Western area, refugees from the occupied countries, bewildered people who needed guidance and encouragement. Mrs. McCloy knew that big problems can be solved from small beginnings. So she bought a few sewing machines and opened a sewing room where the women could make warm winter clothing for their families. Well, the sewing room was an immediate success. As they sewed, the women discussed common interests, found new friends. Within a year, 30 more sewing rooms were begun in the United States zone. Early in 1950, Mrs. McCoy began a series of visits which took her into every town in the U.S. zone, as well as the French and British areas. She spoke to the women told them how American women lived and how they became good citizens. She spoke honestly with German housewives and pulled them out of the depths of self-pity by showing them the meaning of neighborliness. Well, these are but a few examples of what she did to help those who needed help. During her three-year stay in Germany, Mrs. McCloy did much to assure the future of German democracy. As one German housewife put it, for us Germans, Frau McCloy is better even than the Marshall Plan. Yes, Ellen McCloy had proved that by helping others, you help your country. Now, act two of Edward, My Son, starring Walter Pidgeon as Arnold Bolt. During those next few years following the fire, my luck was phenomenal. Everything I did brought success, money, and honors. I was Sir Arnold now, Sir Arnold Bolt. Edward, of course, was in school. And one day, in answer to a letter, I had occasion to visit Mr. Hanway, the headmaster. I uh, hope I haven't kept you waiting for Arnold. Oh, no, not at all. I've been walking through the grounds. Beautiful, simply beautiful. You must be very attached to Green Girl, Mr. Hanway. I am indeed. I don't get to the country much anymore, so I must thank you for writing me. It, uh, it was not a pleasant letter to write, Sir Arnold. I, we don't often admit failure here. No, well, that's where you differ from me. I never admit failure. Now, why do you want to expel my son? I'm not expelling him. I'm perfectly willing that Edward should remain until the end of the term. I find it difficult to see the distinction. Sir Arnold, have you considered that this may be for the good of the boy? Believe me, I have Edward's interest at heart as well as the schools. The schools? How? I find Edward a corrupting influence. I find the idea of my small son corrupting anyone rather absurd. If I didn't, I should be very angry. You uh, don't like Edward, do you? My feelings have nothing to do with it. Well, mine have. I love him. Well, shall I ship him off to a reformatory? No, 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 of course not. There are many excellent schools that specialize. I am not interested in excellent schools that specialize. I wish my son to remain here. I think that Edward is a normal, nice child, and with a little understanding will be a credit to Green Gary. And where do you suppose he learned these things you complain about? From me? From his mother? He learned them here. It's your responsibility, and you're not going to shelve it. I can't accept that, Sir Arnold. Well, you're going to accept it, Mr. Henry. Are you threatening me? I am. Mr. Hanway, there are certain mortgages outstanding on this school. Well? These mortgages were in the hands of Dobson and Company. Were? Mm hmm Anyone holding the mortgages is in a position to foreclose, forcing yourself and the school into bankruptcy. I now hold them. You? I'd throw my mustache, Mr. Hanway, if I had a mustache. Yes, I acquired them when Edward entered here, just in case something like this should arise. Well, it has arisen. And I am now fighting with anything I can lay my hands on. I... I can't believe it. I'd be a hypocrite to say I'm sorry for you. I am prepared, however, to allow you to remain until the end of the term. I believe that's the prospect you offered Edward. Well, well, I wonder what will happen to all these buildings, those playing fields out there. Hmm, factory site, perhaps. One of those luxury hotels. Uh... And you... You really <laughs> believe that what you're doing will... Benefit your son? 
I shall do my best to see that it does. I, I can't believe it. I can't believe that one man can destroy another man's career. A, a whole tradition. Nothing safe anymore. No standards, no principles, no... Good day, Mr. Henry. Uh, Sir Arnold. Wait. Wait, please. Yes? I don't care about myself. I, I do about Ben Gary. You win, Sir Arnold. Win? No. No, it, it isn't a question of winning or losing, Mr. Henry. Let's just say we've worked out a solution. And I suppose it is conceivable that we... Haven't done our utmost here to understand your son? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, Mr. Henry, I think it unwise that you should ever be placed in this position again. I'm giving you this check, an unconditional gift to Green Gary. I suggest you pay off the mortgages at once. But I couldn't possibly accept... It's in the interest of Green Gary, and that's the one thing we're, we, well, we both have at heart, isn't it? You... <laughs> You're an astonishing man, Sir Arnold. Am I? I confess I have always felt skeptical about these Napoleons of finance who rise so mysteriously from obscurity. There's nothing really mysterious about business success. Indeed. Now, in my case, I had a small business and I wanted to enlarge it. But what did you do, son? I set fire to it and collected the insurance. Astonishing. Yes, isn't it? <laughs> incident at Granbury School is one of the facts. It's for you to judge. By 1935, I was several times a millionaire, owning or controlling a dozen great companies. One afternoon, I promised to meet Evelyn at my office. Oh, good afternoon, Miss Pearl. Oh, Lady Bennett, I'm sorry, Sir Arnold isn't back yet. I'm sure he won't be long. Dr. woodhead has been waiting for him, too. Oh, really? He's in the outer office. May I send for tea? Oh, no, Miss Pearl. I'll just go in and chat with Dr. Woodhead. Evelyn, I'm so happy to see you, my dear. Oh, what a nice surprise. Seems like years, Larry. How smart you look. Thank you. Edward and I are just leaving for Switzerland. Did Arnold send for you? Yes. I mean, as a doctor? I'm not sure. I haven't been his doctor officially for some time. Is there anything wrong with him? Not that I know of. Larry, why don't you come to see us anymore? Unofficially. Well, I... I want to, Evelyn, but you know how it is. You didn't come to Edward's last birthday. It was the first one you missed. Yes, I, I know. I just wondered if there was anything we'd said or done, that's all. No. No, of course not. Uh, how is Edward? Oh, he's very grown up now. He shaves every other day. <laughs> this boy's a genius. Is he, Larry? Is he what? I don't know. A genius, maybe. Oh, Larry, I'm so glad to see you again. Tell me about Edward. Oh, well, of course, I know it still spoils him dreadfully. I'm sometimes so afraid he'll never have any real sense of values. There are some things that are so wrong. For instance? Well, I don't know. Well, for one thing, he's, he's not quite as straight about money as he should be. And for another, Arnold lets him have a glass of port in the evening, but but he doesn't always stop at one glass. He's not 17 yet. Maybe he is a genius. Like Arnold? You don't like Arnold anymore, do you? Well, let's just say that I don't approve of some of the things that he does. Lately? Well, the Simpkins savings bank collapse was a few years ago, but... but that was Harry Simpkins. He broke Arnold's heart when it happened. Only Arnold came out of it a much richer man, and Simpkins went to jail. Didn't I read that he killed himself? Yes, it was terrible. You don't know how Arnold tried to help that man. Do you know that some people believe that Simpkins deliberately set fire to their business that time? Then there are other people. Oh, that's horrible. They're jealous of Arnold. Besides, anything he's done has been for me and Edward. Yes, I know. And he's made a most unholy mess of it. Tell me what to do, Larry. It's too late. But Edward's only 16. I'm talking about Arnold. Larry, you're our friend. You have the right to tell Arnold that loving Edward doesn't mean substituting money for... for... 
You can tell him that you can kill something inside a person unless you treat him as a human being. That's all I ask for, Edward. And for yourself. I wasn't talking about myself. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, you were. Sorry, that's wrong to say. You have no right. I have no right to love you either. I... I don't think I and Edward will wonder what happened to me. You knew, didn't you? Yes. I, I've known for a long time. What ought I to do? You, you mean about... I mean about Edward. Hello, Larry. Oh, hello, Arnold. Sorry, I'm late, Evelyn. Well, have you got everything, dear? Travelers' checks, cash? Oh, what about your luggage? Mr. Groves is taking care of everything, Arnold. Good. When we get to Zurich, there will be a brass band and an illuminated address. Well, it could be arranged, you know. Arnold is to be made Lord Bolt next year, Larry. Oh? Oh, uh, just a rumor, but I can't say I wouldn't be pleased to have a title to pass on to Edward. Larry, my boy, you should get married and have children. It's a great incentive. Well, I'm off. Goodbye, Larry. It has been nice seeing you again. Now, what's all this formality between old friends? Goodbye, old friend. My best to Edward. I will. Goodbye, dear. Just have a good time, you hear? And get some of that color back. I'll wire as soon as we get there, Arnold. Yes, do that. Well, she doesn't look well, does she? Well, it's been so long since I've seen her. And uh, how do you think I look, Larry? Oh, much as I expected, Arnold. Amazingly fit. Well, I, I am. Uh, tell me, do you ever look at some of us ordinary human beings? There are those of us who may crack under the strain of trying to keep up with you. Those of us who are foolish enough or loyal enough to try. We should uh, talk about this, Larry, someday when I have a little more time. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, I mean it. Right now, I want to talk to you about your hospital. I want to help you. I want to build a new wing. That's very kind of you, Arnold. Well, why not? After all, I'm in a... Yes? The gentleman from the Admiralty are here, Sir Arnold. Well, we can wait, Miss Byrne. Admiral Benson is with them, sir. Oh, I see. I'll call you right back. I'm sorry, Larry. There's a delegation of gold braid out there. Oh, well, that's quite all right. Look, I'll train you next week and we can have dinner. Yes, I'd be delighted, Arnold. Miss Perrin can always reach me at the hospital. <laughs> that's the trouble with you doctors. Busy, always busy. <laughs> What time is it? Almost half past five, sir. Well, anything left for me to do? Well, there's a personal check if you care to sign it now. Mrs. Harry Simpkins. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You uh, never knew Simpkins, did you? No, Sir Arnold. Poor chap. I really believe he blamed me for what happened to him. He came to see me one day after he'd got out of prison. I wanted to help him set him up in business or something. Instead, he jumped off the roof of this building. It's very kind of you to help his widow. Maybe it's my conscience. What do uh, you think, Miss Perrin? That's possible, I suppose. There's nothing else, Sir Arnold. Oh, oh please, uh, do sit down, won't you? I feel like talking. What are your interests in life, Miss Perrin? Curiously enough, just at the moment, there's Sir Arnold Boat and company. Are they really? Yes. I like finding out about things, don't you? And just what have you found out about me, for instance? I've worked for you for some time, Sir Arnold, but I still regard all information concerning you as strictly confidential. Oh, that's, that's very commendable. Um, what, uh, what do you do evenings, Miss Perrin? I go home. Oh, do you really? What did you suppose happened to me? Oh, I, I, I just thought perhaps you... Well, I don't know. Uh, you're a very interesting girl, Miss Perrin. Uh, would you like to have dinner with me tonight? As a reward for my diligence, Sir Arnold? No, 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 no. I, just, uh, well, just because I'd like to. Do you mind if I go home and dress? As a matter of fact, we we'll both dress. Pick you up at 8? Eight. 8.30. Uh, what, uh, what's that? What, what are you writing down? Just my address, Sir Arnold. Oh. <laughs> That's how it started. Eileen Perrin and I, the love story. Sordid, discreditable. But I want you to know about it. Not because I fancy myself a middle-aged Don Juan, but because it is part of the whole story. Many months later, Eileen discovered that her apartment was being watched. At the time, Evelyn and Edward were in Paris. 
two days later, I joined her there. I'm sorry you didn't let me know you were coming, Arnold. Edward and I are leaving Paris today. Are you leaving? In half an hour. That is, if I can find Edward. What does that mean? It means that I've been checking all the cocktail bars, but I can't find him. So, you're leaving. And where are you going to hide from me? Why should I hide from you? On the advice of your lawyer, I imagine. Anyway, I can tell you where Edward is. I phoned him this morning. Did you? I told him I wanted to surprise you. We thought the best way to keep you here was for him to disappear for a little while. I told him I didn't think you'd be angry. I am angry, but not with him. Like all your actions nowadays, I find it very underhand. And I find it underhand to have one's husband investigated by private detectives. Incidentally, even I, even I haven't the slightest intention of giving you a divorce. I'm delighted to hear you say so. Really? Why? Because I should like you to fight and lose. I want Edward to realize with all your money and power, there are still some things you can't get away with. I've seen Eileen Pern for the last time. You can believe that. What did you tell her, Arnold? Was there a scene? Did she cry? You're not an unattractive man, you know. Stop it. I won't listen to this sort of... I beg your pardon. Anyway, I want Edward to see the sort of man his father is. I think he knows that by now. No. No, he doesn't. He admires you, Arnold, as I used to. He loves you, as I used to. I think a divorce is the only way of bringing Edward to his senses. Why? What has he done now? Edward got very drunk last night. Oh. He's 17, oh, Arnold. I... If he goes on like this, what will he be like at 20? But all young men get tipsy now and then. What's so terrible about that? That you don't think it's terrible. That's what's so terrible. To you, it's all rather a joke, isn't it? When I asked you to stop sending money to him, you promise and then break your promise. I'm frightened, Arnold. I'm frightened for my son. That's why I'm taking him away. Where? Anywhere, away from England, where he can learn what it is to work for his living and, and to have responsibilities. I shall be one of those, too, because I don't intend to take much money with me. Do you think Edward's going to agree to all of this? Oh, poor Edward. It will be quite a shock. But I think he still loves me, and he's not altogether lacking in courage or, or pride. Arnold, I'm... I'm awfully tired. Do you mind going now? Go? Where? I'm still your husband. We're not divorced yet, you know. How long did you tell Edward to stay away? Oh, just long enough for us to have a little chat. Well, we've had it. Please leave. Don't be silly, Evelyn. I'm not trying to excuse Miss Perrin, but I didn't realize that it made you so bitter. I'm sorry. You haven't understood one word of what I've been saying, have you? Just that you think the only way to deal with Edward is to break up his home. Home? Where did he ever have a home? Something that wasn't a cross between a toy department and the Bank of England, presided over by a perpetual fairy godfather who granted his every wish before he even thought of it himself. There are women who'd be grateful to a man who did just that. Possibly, but I'm not one of them. I've seen the fairy godfather when he's off duty, and I think it's time Edward should, too. So you're going to tell him everything? Oh, no. You're going to tell Edward everything? Yes. Yes, yes. I assume that that means Larry, too, of course. Larry? Larry would hope's in love with you, and you think, and I think that you're in love with him. That's why you want the divorce. You must be mad. This is going to be very bad for him, Evelyn. The Medical Association has very narrow ideas about doctors who make love to their patients. Are you accusing me? No, no, not yet. But I'll make very certain that Larry gets his full share of bad publicity. I don't think I ever despised you as much as I do now. I've always fought for Edward, and I always will. And if you think you can slander me, turn him against me. You've made the biggest mistake of your life. Edward is my son. Yes, Arnold. I'm afraid he is. Please, will you go now? Not until you promise to drop this case. Why should I? Because I've made the stakes too high. You never were much of a gambler, were you? Hello? Yes, just a moment. The desk clerk wants to know if we're staying tonight or not. You are staying, aren't you, my dear? I won't tell you. I won't. I won't. Hello? Oh, yes, we're all staying. You send up my baggage, please. <laughs> After two, on the afternoon of August 5th, 1949, 
The country of Ecuador suffered one of the most disastrous earthquakes of the present century. The dead numbered from six to 8,000. 20,000 or more were injured, and 100,000 were made homeless. 53 towns were destroyed or badly damaged. But from United States Army installations in Panama came immediate aid. Military planes shuttled back and forth with emergency supplies, food, medicine, clothing, and especially tents for the homeless. Besides material things, doctors, nurses, and engineers volunteered from far and near to give their own hands in the work of saving lives. The warm-heartedness of these angels in uniform is remembered in Ecuador as a bright light in its darkest hour. Such acts as these, by you and your friends today, are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. the curtain rises on Act Three of Edward, My Son, starring Walter Pidgeon as Arnold Bolt. I fought my wife for my son and my home, and I won. Again, those are the facts. Whether or not I deserve to win is something for you to decide. It's now 1939, with the war starting to close in around us. Larry, my dear, I had no idea you were calling. I've been waiting for your husband, even. Since he fixed the time himself, I thought for once he might be punctual. Oh, he treats you disgracefully. My dear, this is Phyllis Maiden, Dr. Woodhope. Uh, how do you do? Our Dr. Woodhope, Phyllis, who brought Edward into the world. Oh, then I must thank you, Doctor. Here's a secret for you, Larry. Phyllis is my daughter and to be. Well, how wonderful, Miss Maiden. I hope you and Edward will be very happy. Thank you. Yes, they will be. I know. Very happy. Well, I think we must run that evening. I'll never be at the Barclay by 8.30. We're having a little party, Larry. Join us. Oh, please do. Oh, I'm sorry, but I am rather busy these days, you know. I'm sorry, too. Goodbye, darling. And do tell Edward not to keep us waiting. Yes, yes, I'll tell him to hurry, dear. What do you think of her? Very lovely. I, Edward? Well, perhaps marriage is what he needs. Oh, come now. That's a rather drastic reform, isn't it? We'll have a drink to celebrate. How do you think I'm looking, Larry? Fine. Fine. When I get Edward married, maybe I'll try taking the cure. Do you think people know I drink? No, I don't. Arnold does. Perhaps that's why he sent for you. Perhaps he thinks you... Okay. Well, as usual, my apologies. Well, that's all right, Arnold. Did you bring Edward back with you? Yes, he uh, went upstairs to dress. Evelyn, you haven't forgotten the party tonight. No, Arnold, but uh, I think I'm going to have one of my headaches. Just run up and change, dear. You'll be late. Didn't you hear me? I said I was going to have a headache. You're not going to have a headache, Evelyn. You're not going to spoil Edward's party. You see, Larry, no headache. Isn't it marvelous? You and Edward go ahead. I'll join you there later. Uh, well, I suppose we can talk here, Larry. I'll close the door. Well, what's wrong, Anna? Where does it hurt? No, 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 none of your little doctor jokes. I feel fine. I asked you here because I want you to meet someone, a girl. Well, Miss Maiden, I've already met her. Congratulations. Thanks, but she's not the girl I'm talking about. You see, Edward's already married. But, uh, who is joking now? Nobody. It happened ten days ago. Edward's been in Sussex. Been doing a lot of flying lately. Anyway, some of the pilots staged a party, and when Edward woke up, he discovered he was married. Oh, the girl was no stranger, I suppose, but... Believe me, he had no intention to... What about to... Evelyn? Does she know? No, 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 of course not. No one knows. I'm having the marriage in Elves. There'll be no publicity. And the bride from Sussex agrees to all this? I think she will. Yes? 
Young lady to see you, my lord. Oh, yes, I'm expecting you have her come in, please. Well, does Edward know that she's here? Yes, he gave us carte blanche to handle the whole deal. Oh, that's very considerate of Edward. I wanted a witness, Larry. You don't mind? You're a doctor and an old friend. Well, at least I'm a doctor. Miss Foxley, my lord. Miss Foxley, I'm Lord Bolt. How do you do? And this is Dr. Woodhope, old friend of the family. He brought Edward into the world. Well, I'll never live that down. How do you do? You were uh, very nice to come here. Please sit down. I've always wanted to meet Edward's father. I've seen your pictures, of course. I wish we had met under happier circumstances. Well, uh, I suppose we may just as well get down to business. You don't mind Dr. Woodhope being here, do you? No, no, I don't mind. How long have you known Edward, Miss Foxy? Nearly a year. You knew who he was, of course. Well, not at first I didn't, my lord. And you, you, you think he's in love with you? Edward's a funny boy, you know. I, I think he's a bit afraid of responsibility. It's, it's made him stop loving me for a while. But we are married, and... Uh, and what? Well, I, I don't know. But I know it's going to be all right. But it's not that he's weak. It's, it's just that he thinks I... Well, I, I need him marry me. And suppose that I think so, too? Edward deeply regrets having married you. He wants it to know. Yes, I know. He, he sent me a letter. But he must tell me to my face. It, it's no good he's running away like this. Well, the thing we have to think about now is... Uh, what are you going to do? I don't know, my lord. Miss Foxley, will you be guided by me, Miss... Uh, do you have a family? No, no one. I'd like to be your friend, if you'll allow me. Thank you, Lord Bolt. Now, I'm not for a moment condemning Edward's conduct. I think he behaved very badly, but... Uh, oh, um... Larry, I think Betty and I can work this out between ourselves, after all. Well, that's all right, Arnold. I'm quite interested in your plan. Yes, I know, but it is rather a family matter, and I... Uh, I don't mind him being here, my lord. Really, I must insist. I'll leave on one condition... If Miss Foxley gives me a promise. Now, if Lord Bolt suggests something that you don't agree with, you'll walk out of here. Oh, now, really, after all, go on, get out of here. With then you. I've had a promise. Then promise, Miss Foxley, please. Let's get something settled tonight. I promise, Dr. Whitehook. Satisfied? Well, I'm not satisfied, but I'll go. Then if I can be of any help, I'm in the phone book, Miss Foxley. Lawrence Whitehook. Well, now we can get on with it. He's a nice fellow, but a bit of an old woman, you know. And I'm a fool, aren't I, Lord Bolt? Nonsense. You're a young and pretty girl, and one day you're going to make the proper marriage. But I'm not such a fool as to think I could fight for Edward against you. Besides, if Edward really loved me... I want to take care of you. I don't need anyone to take care of me. Edward's the one who needs that. But what are you going to do? Nothing that need call you any worry, Lord Bolt. Not even any money. If Edward wants the moment. He can have it. It was that simple. Edward and Phyllis Maiden were married the following spring. It wasn't the elaborate wedding I had planned. It took place during an air raid. Edward in the uniform of an RAF pilot. Three months later, Edward was dead. Hello, Lane. You're not today? You need to be my friend. I've been away and I would have just heard. My heavenly salvation. You have a glass of wine, Larry. It's his birthday, Larry. Of course. Thank you. Edward, my son. During his first birthday party, Arnold's toast, the world's your oyster. Very well. Well, if you think of that day. But I've seen such a perfect start, and yet it was only the beginning of the end. Oh, oh maudlin, drunken old woman, Larry. Why do you waste your time? Evelyn. But I went wrong, Larry, and I don't know why. That's what I want to know, why. It, it wasn't that Edward was weak and that Arnold spoiled him. Other people spoil their children and they get over it. Why couldn't Edward? Edward would have got over it. He would have been all right. Oh, I must go down to the wardrobe. You have to be back soon. You're welcome someone to talk to. I shall go quietly up to my room and drink myself to sleep. I keep a bottle there. Just quietly by myself. Isn't it extraordinary what people do? <laughs> <laughs> 
No, no, please. Are you still in love with me, Larry Woodhope? Would you like to? No. The trouble with drink is that it makes you just a little bit uncool. by asking Summers for any more because he won't let me have it. It's rationed, you know, by my husband. Well, oh, oh, here he is. Ladies and gentlemen, Lord Bolt. Well, thanks of you to come. I've been away, Arnold. I didn't know. I've just uh, been down to see Edward's commanding officer. Just about the best pilot in the squadron, that's what he said. Didn't know what fear was, a born leader of... What an extraordinary life that man must have, sitting around there all day telling parents fairy stories about their dead sons. Edward was killed stunting his plane. Don't you think you'd better go to bed? No, Arnold, I want to find out about Edward. I never really knew Edward properly, not like his commanding officer. He summed him up in 30 seconds. Just as long as it takes a sparrow to fall to the ground. They said it would take Edward about 30 seconds to fall. He wasn't very high. I wonder what he thought about. What his commanding officer would say, I suppose, a born leader of men, just like his father. I thought that would please you, Arnold. He didn't say where you thought of leading me. Really. He didn't know the real joke. <laughs> He didn't know that the leader himself had lost all sense of direction. Edwin, please, let me help you. Oh, no, no, no. Well, well, just to the staircase, perhaps. <laughs> well, it's amazing. I, I can never find that staircase. <gasps> oh, here it is. Do you have any steps there, Mary? I do. I've counted them. You see, sometimes one can't see quite as clearly as one would wish, and, and, and then it's a great help to count. One, two, three, four. Goodbye, Larry. Bye. She, she says things she doesn't mean, Larry. You mustn't blame her. I don't blame her. Oh, I suppose Edward might have been a different boy if I had been another sort of man. But I wouldn't change his memory by a hair's breadth. You think I spoiled him, don't you? No, no. I did what I thought was best for my son because I loved him. You can't do any more than that, can you? Can you? Can you? Well, I am not telling you anything. You may as well. 
You know I'll find out sooner or later. And I'm trying planning a little trip to America, and I'd like to take the boy with me. It'll do him good. Yes, I thought you might be getting tired of England by now. Now, why do you say that, Larry? Oh, rumors. You and the bank inspectors? Larry, where is my grandchild? No, I'm sorry to learn there, Arnold. I'm sorry for you. But no, Betty is married again. Happily married. You'll never find her. You're a fool, Larry. But I don't need your help. I could use it, but I don't need it. Everybody in this crazy country is turning against me these days. But I'll beat all of you. You, the bank inspectors, and anyone who gets in my way. I always have and I always will. Hmm. These baby pictures. It's ridiculous. They're all beginning to look like me. sent me to prison. Prison, mind you, for burning down a furniture store back in 1924. But that's all behind me now, and I can get on with the search for my grandson. He'd be 13 now, 13 years old. Well, that's the whole story. What I did and why I did it. What's your answer? If you had been me, what would you have done? Good night. while the children will return. When the news reached the 10th Air Rescue Group in Alaska that a diphtheria epidemic had hit the tiny Eskimo village of Nondalton, there was an immediate response from the men of the outfit. They volunteered to fly through the treacherous northern skies, landing on frozen wastes where no plane had been before, and they evacuated over 130 people. It takes courage of a very definite sort for a man to face combat, to engage an enemy on a battlefield. It also takes courage to risk life and limb in performing a service of mercy, not in the line of duty, but straight from the heart. Such acts as these, by you and your friends today, are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Wally Pigeon. Well, Walter, I seem to remember hearing you play on a boat once before, and uh -huh. I think you even surpassed that performance tonight. Well, I've uh, had mighty good support both times. Don, last time I co-starred with Deborah Carr, who was in the original picture. Mm, you and Deborah must like co-starring, aren't you? Both in your latest uh, MGM comedy, Dream Wife? That's right. And we got some mighty good support from uh, Kerry Grant tonight. <laughs> what a starring trio. <laughs> Two handsome actors and one of our most beautiful girls. You know, it's always a pleasure, Don, to co-star with a beautiful woman. And uh, I understand you sign one for your play next week. Oh, yes, indeed. And she just happens to be a fine actress, too. And Baxter. Ah, yeah. I'm sure everyone will want to hear her in one of Paramount's most delightful romantic comedies, The Affairs of Susan. I couldn't agree with you more, Don. Good night. Good night. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.